Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Squawk Out podcast stream, and today it's a podcast. Um, right now, uh, Bitcoin is trading at 10271 bucks, and we had a terrible day in the market. Well, terrible from the bull's perspective. Anyway, uh, price is going down. Uh, it doesn't look like it's stopping yet. It is bouncing off of a 0.25 Fibonacci, and so, but all that's going to be dated information by the time this comes out. Um, this will probably come out in a sev several days. So uh, we're gonna move on from that and, uh, and welcome our guest. Our guest is uh, Bob Rules and uh, he's an artist and uh, a musician, painter, sculptor, ladies man galore. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding, man. Uh, so, uh, so let's get started, Bob, what's up, man? How you doing? How's everybody doing? Whoever's gonna hear this, I'm I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, so um, so let's get into we 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 met a couple of days ago and we started discussing uh, how uh, how life has been and uh, and so we're, shit. Hold on, let me take this off my ear real quick. Right now there's like a <laughs> bunch of trains going off and I was like just binging in my ear. Um, so. We met a couple of days ago and uh, and discussed what's been going on in your life. Um, I wanted to start with uh, art because you're uh, kind of a you, you've been an artist for a couple of decades now. Yeah. Um, and uh, especially probably within the last ten years, you become maybe some someone would say a brilliant artist, right? <laughs> like uh, some great opportunities have happened thanks to that. Um, starting from nothing or, or not having any sort of huge break. Uh, yeah, I would say the past 10 years, man, um, going internationally uh, to do art, paintings, uh, tattooing, it, it literally blew up more than I ever imagined. Of course, you have the dreams of like, this would be cool to do, but then when it's actually there, it's kind of like this disbelief of it's actually happening all because I, you know, I didn't quit or you keep giving it all you have so. what it, like what uh, how did you how did you get to become like a i guess you could say a professional artist or uh uh i mean it it puts it puts food on the table doesn't it like, yes right yeah. so it's not like uh not like a starving artist life necessarily right uh well i mean of course you've known me since we were kids like the whole uh, drawing has always been in my life, like since age four. Um, and I've always had this ambition, like this obsessive, you know, love for it. And then, so that turned into dabbling in painting growing up, dabbling in, you know, spray paint, any medium that I could get my hands on. Um, I finally got an opportunity by someone which is crazy, who, who saw me drawing at a coffee shop back in the days when we used to go hang out at coffee shops and smoke cigarettes all night. Someone saw my art, saw me drawing and asked to see my portfolio and, and you know, they were like, hey, you should try tattooing or be a tattoo artist. And, and back then I was actually looking for an apprenticeship and uh, the guy that was talking to me actually owned a tattoo shop. Um, and he ended up becoming a, a best friend because he gave me such an opportunity. We got so close and learned so much off of each other artistically through the years. Um, his name's Andy Gruno. He's a tattoo artist, amazing tattoo artist now. Uh, Here in town or somewhere? Uh, he's in Medina, Medina Lake area. Medina Lake, Texas? Yeah. Okay. And great guy. Um, he was the one who gave me that first initial, like, this is the universe giving you an opportunity to do something with it, you know? And at that shop I had seen, uh, there was like six apprentices, including myself, that were coming in and out of the shops. And I was the only one that wasn't giving up. And I know that he saw that. So, you know, I was obsessively just doing the same thing I was, except now with the focus of becoming a tattoo artist. And that was my first big, any opportunity. And that got me, um, as you know, I was a high school dropout. So I was like, 
wandering the world with these odd jobs, hoping to make a living doing either music or art. And that opportunity came and so it became, um, that's kind of how it all started. From there, I got to go to college. In college, I learned to sculpt and, and do special effects type stuff. Uh, I had gone to college up in Pennsylvania for that. And then just kind of stretched my, my ability, I guess you can say. And right after college, people started commissioning me for paintings. And those, because of social media, like just started, I started getting requests from friends of friends all around the country and then eventually all around the world. And now that's kind of where it's blown up to, which is pretty cool. So this, it is now. Yeah, let's talk about some of the some of the specifics with that. Like, so you mentioned that you got your start as, a, as an apprentice before you were always kind of, I remember like uh, sketching and sketchbooks yeah. and stuff yeah. like that, right? And then that turned into uh, tattooing uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, with Andy. And then uh, you kind of started branching out from there, right? T talk about those early days as a tattoo artist. There's a lot of politics involved, I noticed, <laughs> with, with, with tattoo shops. And yeah. so how did that um, help or hinder your, your career <laughs> advancement? See, well, a lot of the, the shops I did, in fact, work out always were full of drama, man. Like one artist hates this guy and he said this about him. Uh, when I was with Andy in the beginning, it had this family vibe. There was a small group of us that just, we hung out before we went to the tattoo shop. We hung out at the tattoo shop. We hung out and went to go draw or drink a few beers or whatever after the tattoo shop. So feeling that camaraderie in that particular shop was, I would say, probably one of the only times I ever felt that. Um, felt? The, the, the closeness between an entire shop, you know, uh -huh. there would be you know spats here and there but uh that was a great uh thing to just kind of feed off of other people wanting to learn as much as you do did it take a while to to get to that point or was it yes. did you just jump in there and it was like that anyone who knows me knows in the beginning i'm very shy but then once you when i open up i don't shut up about anything pretty much right. <laughs> That's kinda how it, it's always been that way so um it took a few weeks because I would just go there and I was scared to step out of my little bubble and that's how I've always been, uh, like I said, until I get comfortable. Uh, it took a few weeks and then noticing that how much fun we would have aside from wanting to do this as a living, you know, that kind of helped me love it even more. And I'm still, you know, Andy's a great friend, uh, great dude, you know, and, and I have few of them in this industry. I, I'd say I have about three solid is that just because there's a culture of like i don't know negative characters or in like what would opinion, you say yes it's always there's a lot of egos there's a lot of why are you saying this about me behind my back type of thing it's very like i don't know man ego driven i guess is the the thing and i honestly like i don't have that ego that goes along with being good i'll, I'll say that i'm good at what i do everything i love doing i i obsess over learning and getting better over time but i don't let it I guess turn me into an asshole and mm -hmm. you kind of see that a lot with anything in a lot of creative endeavors when someone has a bit of success say doing paintings or it, it happens very easily you know someone can think well I'm automatically better than everybody or you know it's kind of one thing that drew me away from from getting so big into the community is that it's kind of a disappointment you know especially if you meet say someone like a hero and you're just they're just kind of an asshole but um yeah, I, I after that I, I worked at a few other shops and didn't just didn't see the closeness um, that I was getting or learning off of other people as I was learning when I was with Andy under Andy's wing. And it never it never grew into that at other shops. No, I you know along the way, like I said, I found maybe two or three other tattoo artists that are like, man, those guys are my friends. Like I consider them like part of my family. Um, but it's... So how did you navigate like the negative side of the politics? How did you navigate, you know, the hater in the shop or the asshole boss? Like it, it would kind of make me just go back into my bubble. I was there to work, but then that wasn't as fun because you're doing something you love, and you it kind of turns into, you know, the same type of job you hated working before you got to do what you loved. You know what I mean? So I just kind of stick to myself and just roll with the tide, you know, and and. And so at some, at some point you went to school, right? Like where, college, like, yeah, I, it was yeah uh, art, art college, eight, 2007, 2008. Yeah. And, and so what were the factors that drove you from 
just being a local tattoo artist to going and getting your art degree? Uh, I guess the, the blessing and the curse kind of thing was like, I never could learn enough. So as a tattoo artist, by that time, I was already getting a good reputation, you know, um, the stability of, of going to a shop every day. And my mind was kind of digging for something new. And I think that's always been something I have that, you know, sometimes it really sucks to think like that and sometimes it's the best thing in the world. So curiosity, it, it satisfies, yeah, but it you kills know, a cat. Like, yeah. Hey, I've gotten good at this. Well, what other medium can I use? So you go from pencil to colored pencil to watercolor to acrylic to oil to sculpting to like my my brain does not stop anywhere in anything. It's it's always like, dude, how can I get better? And what I had noticed is it's all relative. Like if you practice one thing enough, you'll get you know, better at something else. It helps, you know, painting helps tattooing and drawing helps uh, sculpting kind of thing. And for me, I was just looking to expand my ability, you know, and in, and in college, learning everything from, from theater makeup, face painting, to sculpting, to, you know, mold making, everything was just this abundance of love that I found because I, I saw all these new avenues that, some I was really good at and some I sucked intensely at. Even a teacher telling me like mold making wasn't my thing because I was so shitty at it. Like was laughing at me like don't ever make this a career because you suck. But it was still the, the opportunity was there to learn and especially being in a school with, you know, a giant group of other creatives with the same ideas. To me, that's rare, you know, like I don't see that much in my life anymore and I kind of am looking to expand on that to meet more people you like think that. you think you might go back uh to further your degree possibly it's been on my mind i'm not sure but if i do i would love to go somewhere far away just because you know there's nothing better than leaving your comfort zone yeah. physically and mentally you know like i could have just stayed tattooing my whole life but i just love that i moved away to a state i had never been to do you have an idea are there like art schools like in areas that you think would be like inspiring i'm assuming that's why you would want to move far away because you well, want to be inspired by well, the area it's funny like i have uh, the another ambition another medium that i had seen that i've that i have a few credits for is acting just to me acting is another canvas we'll get to that yeah yeah completely empty uh as far as how good i am at it but it's it's something i've always seen as another canvas that's blank that you get to create like hey you know give me psycho give me sad give me weird give me funny and you have this blank canvas and and you know you can create it any way you want which is cool so that's honestly my next endeavor i guess you can say is acting yeah yeah and yeah. i have yeah i have three you know film credits so far not big but I gotta call out my buddy Josh, uh, Josh Zaps. He does film. Uh, he hired me to do a skit, and it was a lawyer skit where I was uh, some a dumb hippie drummer lawyer. Right. Apparently, he wrote the part exactly for me because I use all my own wardrobe, all my antics, and I played drums in the air with my drumsticks, which I do. All well, the you're time. quite a character. Like, as, so, like, like, <laughs> if, if, if when somebody meets you and you're in your extroverted mode, you yeah. can be very charismatic. Like, people actually flock to you, don't they? I, I guess. I, I, guess I, I mean, I understand <laughs> you're being humble, but you kind of serve as like a focal point for the community. I mean, case in point, your New Year's, <laughs> your New Year's party yeah. <laughs> was insane. Oh man, uh, yeah, those are great. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess so, man, and and. What was so cool is that his, the skit we did and just got, I found out this week, he had messaged me this week that the skit, uh, it's called The Relationship Contract, got accepted into the Comedy Austin Film Festival. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, you know, and I'm more ecstatic for him and he's messaging me, it was because of you. I'm like, no, dude, it was your vision. <laughs> like, I showed up in my clothes being, like you said, that extroverted, goofy, person i can right, be and yeah. just kind of was like well just tell me what lines to say so i i give i still give all the credit to him you know for all the work he put into it all the money he put into it and the ideas he had right there's so, the hard work but there's also innate talent involved and I, I and that's probably where his appreciation for you came because you're just charismatic and so that's gonna shine through i think in any I hope kind so, of man. i hope i, hope. I th dude i saw it <laughs> i know you i know you haven't watched it why haven't no. you watched it yet i'm too embarrassed I, 
he doesn't know this either, but he wanted me to see it, and I saw the first two seconds of me in frame, <laughs> uh-huh. and I paused it and was like shaking, like, dude, I'm so embarrassed, like, I can't get over, you know, looking past that. That's me, you know, acting in front of the camera. So you don't think that's because somebody at some point, you know, in one way or another, probably another, told you that you couldn't act that way. Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, growing up, man, like having the the teachers, you know, da- you know, downgrading. We, we had, we had like, some challenging teachers, and we, and, yeah. and they and they targeted you at, totally. at different points. And yeah. I guess subconsciously, maybe it was Effective. like this embarrassment that I always do carry myself, even posting a new painting on social media, right. still gets me like, oh my god, I'm I'm about to push you know completed and it's gonna upload and i'm you know i'm already picking the painting apart that it's not good enough or but and that's part of that thing that that contrast you know it, it's part of what makes me who i am but it's also why i'm so self-conscious about everything and not fully confident and extremely you know just away from getting all that limelight uh, it, i think those are symptoms that that come with being humble and intelligent right I mean, I mean <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think a lot of intelligent people have those same issues. You know, they're introverted. They're, you know, because once you grapple with the reality of the way the world is and you're not willing to play that game, then yeah. then you you you, you kind of are faced with like the brutality of it all, which causes anybody who's still going to love to retreat into their shell. Yeah. yeah you know what true. I mean? See, you, you can see that. I kind of just... You're getting that out of me because I, I I don't notice you know a lot of that stuff. But you but but you've probably thought about it in some some co- subconscious yeah. way, right? Totally, like yeah, why yeah. is this going on? Yeah. No, yeah, I get it, man. So I mean, I guess with me being you know becoming what I have become so far in life, like I I find it the most rewarding when somebody messages me, tells me that it was because of me that they started to paint, pick up an instrument you know pursue this pursue that because they saw how i did it and to me i think that's my purpose is to just inspire like get that one dude that's gonna you know i'm gonna have that conversation with him and he's gonna be like you know what i'm gonna go join a band or or whatever whatever even if if it's something that's not something i do but um just to inspire him to get out of his comfort zone you know that's all i've been doing i've never been in a comfort zone yeah. with music or with art it's always been that scary path and i find it the most rewarding how can uh, how can people find your art online uh instagram facebook my instagram's bob rules 82 b-o-b-r-u-l-e-s 82 mm. um and they can reach out to you there too yeah they... yeah message anything it's not, nothing's on private um people tell me to make separate pages one for painting one for music one for i i don't i don't i'm not that psychotic about social media to begin with it to me it's just you know, putting my stuff out there. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. Um, so I keep it all in one page. It's my personal page. It's my art page, painting, tattoos, sculpting, drumming, all, everything. All yeah, yeah, everything I do, um, you know, it, I just post it on there. So it's not limited to anything that I, you know, one thing. Do you ever do I, living rooms? Ever do what? <laughs> living rooms? What do you mean? What's like that? Painting in a living room. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, yes. Uh, people are like, oh, you're an artist. Can you paint my walls? I'm like, no, but I guess if the money's right. <laughs> There's no way that's fun to me. That's just uh, step-by-step type stuff. Uh, that's cool, uh, yeah. What guess. about What about this film? How, like how, um, how can we find uh, what's it called again? The the one that just the, came out that won the award. It's called the relationship contract. Uh, there's there's a video video on on Facebook. Um, uh, the, from what I know, that's you know that's how I saw it, and, and that's the, how the guy's it. name uh, that, that put it on out? Facebook is Josue Zapata. J o s u e z a p a t a, right? Did I say that right? Yeah, so yeah I think it sounds. It sounds it's right. called the relationship contract. Uh, it's right now, which is really cool. It got over fifty thousand views. Wow! And also the news of getting into the film festival, which I never would have imagined. How is that gonna work with um, Corona? Like, are they gonna have like a fe- like an actual festival? He actually or? had a ticket. He wanted me to go for the premiere in, in the film festival. I have no idea. I don't know if it's uh, every three seats away or like, something. Like, yeah, or, social distancing. Yeah, watch it from your car. I don't know how that works. How's, how's that affected you? 
How is how's Corona affected um, you and your family? You said that. You yeah, know. well, my whole family got it. Yeah. Uh, bad. They got they got, you know like uh, had one cousin that got no taste and you know that was kind of her. yeah that well, tested positive. But then my my folks, you know, they got super crazy sick. Mom couldn't breathe for what was it like six days? Was she ever hospitalized? They couldn't go because the hospital was full. Yeah. And I was I was on the road. I was in Minnesota doing some music, uh, laying some tracks with my band in Minnesota, um, and I was terrified, man. Like getting that phone call. I was on my way here and uh, hearing my mom's voice. That you know just stressed yeah sick like the food times 10 saying well i have it your dad has it your brother my brother lives in the same like area like is like your brother has it his girlfriend has it and and uncles have it so it was really scary man um i was terrified and i was gonna stay in minnesota because we all live in the same like area and she was just saying to stay away completely and um i just had to come home just in case they got worse or if they needed me and they all got better Oh yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. There, everybody's good now. You okay, know, good. Thankfully, so. Well, good man. Kind of scary. Yeah, it's was, kind of yeah, scary. the whole thing is just weird. It is, yeah. yeah. Thankfully, I mean, I, I, I had still traveled to Minnesota. Um, we took, you know, you just take your precautions and do what you can. Uh, the airports was kind of weird because, uh, seeing, seeing an airport not as packed as it normally is, or an airplane that's kind of spaced out, like, it's kind of comfortable. That must be how the rich VIPs yeah. in the first class seating, like, seating area, yeah. yeah. And the plane, dude. Yeah, when I, I mean, when, like, dude, when I saw uh, Inception and I saw the first class area on that on that <laughs> plane, I was like, yeah. I've never seen that before oh, in my yeah, life. yeah, <laughs> man, yeah. Wow. So, Have you ever flown first class? No, no, no. no yeah, it's crazy. No, yeah, I've seen it. You get, of course, you get to see it on the plane, and it's like, it must be nice. It's extra yeah. leg room. And I, my brother did it once and said that there's free drinks, and wow. you get smashed in the first class. <laughs> like, yeah. That must be nice. I, I plan to. That'd be nice to just say I did, but it, yeah. it's not a necessity for how I travel. So, um, so uh, you mentioned music. Let's talk about uh, music. How, how did you get involved in music? Like, talk about your beginnings, oh, like when you man. first picked up a pair of drumsticks or why? Well, my grandfather, my dad's dad was a drummer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like a heritage family yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, he he had it. And then my dad played drums in high school, had a set. But when he got married and had kids, he sold the drum set, but it was still just in my blood. It was in my brain. Like the first time I heard, you know, music, the first thing I that I caught my attention was the drums. I didn't hear what the, the vocals were saying or anything like that. Um, the drums were just in my soul. And I, I had my hands, you know, I'm just playing on everything and they were like, okay, well, he won't shut up with that. So maybe that's something he loves. So I just, <laughs> it was in my blood. Did they buy you a drum set, or were you playing on grandpa's, or what? Um, uh, no, no, no. There was no drum set until you know my later years. Which you is were just crazy. banging it out on the back of your mom's car seat, or what? Car seat, <laughs> pots and pans. Um, we had damn my, dude, legit, yeah. legit humble startings, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there was an abandoned house in my neighborhood, and my aunt said, "There's a drum out, sitting outside in all this trash," and they brought it, and I literally had that for about three years and i used spoons as drumsticks that's all i had but i i was doing rudiments already i was already just obsessing over you know following a, a, a song to the t of what the drums were doing according to just that you know shitty little drum i had and a pair of spoons and a pair of spoons yeah <laughs> my dad my dad had given me a pair he had in high school um did he use and for I, that or what? Well, no, no, no. He had them. They were his yeah. in marching band. And then, of course, me, I lost them as I lose everything. So it felt kind of bad. So I guess I couldn't, you know, get another pair. So I just had spoons. So so, so, so that, that was the, the, the beginning. But what, when did it become, like, uh, where you were actually playing shows and recording songs in studios and stuff oh, like man, that? Oh, man, that wasn't until I was already 19. I, I was, it's like, you, it's like I told you, like, I was so in my shell. No high school or middle school no, band? No. Uh, they didn't let me in middle school because I was failing, so they literally set me in the corner. I was always the loud one. Wow. So, yeah, I literally never did anything in, in No formal training? Band. No formal training, no. Um, so... I was so shy to, to say I want to join a band or be in a band, you know, and it wasn't until I was, I think, 18 or 19 that I finally came around and joined one band. Um, 
played my first show um you know did all that stuff and it and from there joined another band found another band found another person and it was like first studio experience all within like the, the 19 20 year old range and then you know come 22 23 was like first time we went on tour first time we were in a real and this was in what with what band 42 minute dive or something uh, before the it? very the very first band with like studio experience and bigger shows was 42 minute dive and, and you guys went on tour a couple of times didn't you uh, just regionally yeah regionally like, uh, like one or two like shows. a texas tour but then the this other band uh called the buzz killers out of austin texas the had Buzz seen Kills. me yeah. yeah i remember they that. had seen me were like well we want you as a drummer i joined that band and they were like well we tour for like two to three and so, weeks so 42 minute dive was like more like uh pop punk and then buzz killers was more ska punk ska, uh, thrashier little... punk yeah, yeah 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 and and they were that's where i got my experience on the road living on the road like because you, you were know, on tour what for years right off, oh well, i mean not constantly off, but yeah, yeah we were off. you know I come home, not unpack my suitcase or whatever, my backpack full of crap, and because it was happening again. So um, that was the first time. Like you know, you you living with dudes in a van is. Are the bus killers on Spotify? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, something like that, iTunes or whatever. But um, um, that was the first time experiencing real road life. You know, like yeah. the shittiness, the. You know the the smell the guy with smelly feet and you know this and that like sleeping in a van and i remember one time it was like five degrees and it was like blizzard snowing uh we're sleeping outside of a walmart you know we're driving to the next city that was normal not showering i had this long hair back then too like not showering for three days because you couldn't find a shower we couldn't you know couldn't afford a hotel you know that it was was that the was that the band that you would say that you had like the craziest road experiences with? Yes, it seems like it, it was, would be. Oh, I remember man. those guys. I mean, and I guess it's like anything else because it was the first time. You're just like, oh my god, this you're is you're so amped up. Yeah, it, well, I was it still am, but it was just the first time for anything. It's just like you know, it's an oh my god experience. Like it's the newness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, about what about like crazy rock star stories? Like, did you guys end up like in uh, like any like uh, scantily clad woman's house and then <laughs> non events no. occurred? No, it's <laughs> funny. I guess you have to be either more famous or more successful to kind of have the that. But there were a couple of sharks in the Buzz Killers, though, right? Oh, we, everywhere. Yeah, in and out, around. They're they're always there. Um, but it's always one guy grabbing like that one chick and dragging him off to the <laughs> yeah, back yeah, of the yeah. bar yeah there's no there's no need for names but you know there, there's one oh. in every group yeah, yeah you're like oh this guy you know <laughs> it's funny, Th yeah. thankfully it wasn't me uh thankfully yeah man well, <laughs> well yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. with you, it wasn't freaking me and even was funny like the speaking of dedication like of two you know to things like you yeah. have that in your face every day you're you're playing one bar you're driving the next night you're playing another bar it's party time it's party time it's party time it can catch up with you really quick and i always was too afraid to let that consume me during those times of like heavy music so i was the one that was drinking like two beers a month type of thing uh college was a different story because it's college like you've always <laughs> uh like been in in and out of like the straight edge right I wouldn't say straight edge, you know, like not by intention. It was just more of like, I'm I really, need to get this done. Yeah. Like I, I'm yeah. really trying to do this 110%. So I have to, you know, fly straight, say like, like playing drums, especially like, I will say like, I'm very like aggressive when I play, if mm. I don't stay in any sort of shape for that and we go on tour, I'm going to pay for it on tour. So it's not about partying. It wasn't about the crazy women. How many can you get it? For me, it was always go on that stage and give it your absolute best, which is awesome. Like, and I still do that. And it, it's never changed. It's never like, it's it's about partying. It's more about, I just want to play my show ride and play good. And when you're on the road, you want to be in shape for the road. You kind of have to condition yourself to it. If you're aggressive, you know, like not everybody plays super aggressive. So, I mean, I'm, this is my own personal experience. So, yeah. What about uh, what about after the Buzz Killers? You did uh, you're doing so you're doing a couple projects right now, right? I have a band here in San Antonio called Hunters of the Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, I was off and on with them about two years ago. I got super busy on the road, so I kind of we left on good terms. 
now I'm back with them and we're going back in the studio at the end of this month actually and Sunday which is what two days from now I'm leaving to Minnesota to do more tracks with my band Fall Risk out of Minnesota uh, Rochester Minnesota the, that name was started by um, all of the guys in the original founding band all worked at the Mayo Clinic, which is cool. So they use Fall Risk as like a joke, like, hey, let's call ourselves Fall Risk. And me and the, the singer and I had history. So he called me when they didn't like what their drummer was doing. He wasn't showing up for practices. Um, I came by there in clutch, as we had talked about the other day. <laughs> clutch in is, clutch. you know, yeah, when you're just there, yeah, beating the buzzer, at, you know, with the three-pointer type thing. They had. Yeah, no, I think <laughs> I was the only idiot that didn't know what clutch meant, dude. <laughs> I, hey, I might be wrong. I don't know. I, uh, they had a big show coming up, and they had, to, they had 17 songs on their set list, and they didn't want to cancel the show to get in bad terms with the promoter and the bar they were playing. So they, you know, the singer was like, hey, I know Bob, Bob can learn 17 songs in a week, which is kind of a thing that I was proud to do until you have to do it again and again. Because it's happened a few times where you're it just was, in clutch, painful. like, hey, yeah. man, we need you. We, you got to do this show. We can't fuck it up. You're, you the, gotta you're learn the clutch hitter, like the clinch hitter. <laughs> I suppose. Not by intention, that's for sure. But so I went there and I did the show. Everyone in the band was like, okay, we want you to be our drummer. They were getting rid of the old guy that was not doing his job so um i saw it as an opportunity man and, and i got to now play the north part of america going on tour so i had never done that with the buzz killers uh any other band was more on the south end of the u.s so i have that so now i'm i'm flying for tattooing i'm flying for you know music it's pretty cool it's, it's a very hectic schedule and i'm wouldn't have it any other way so you're you're uh you're gonna be going out of town soon for another another uh two weeks yeah show? yeah we uh no no show this time just studio writing new, new tunes and recording Is it, we talked about this last time where um i wanted to know if you had ever done uh uh like a studio retreat yes right? I did that. is that is that what this is gonna be it, kind of yeah it's i mean it's not at a like a, a huge studio where they have your own room. It's at you know one of the bandmates' house and the studio's in the basement, which is it, I think it's even cooler because that's just your focus. You know, like we're there. You wake up, you eat some crappy food, you go downstairs and you work and you work and you work and you put it together. So um, there's a lot less time to slack, which is cool because there's nothing else there to do. Know? Yeah. yeah. So I had been to a studio where we did that. We stayed the night there and had the retreat. It was awesome. Like. Um, it never gets old, I'll say that. Like, there's that newness experience you have the first time, but the love for it is always just there. It's awesome, like... And that's with, uh, Fall Risk or Hunter's Moon? Uh, Hunters of the Moon is here. Fall Risk is in Minnesota. What kind of music do they do? Hunters of the Moon is, is kind of a little harder to pinpoint. It's like, uh, I get, like, a little psychedelic, a little bit of, um, alternative, even a touch of, like, some grunginess in there. And what's cool about this band and even Fall Risk is letting me just have the creative freedom as a drummer is never like, you must set yourself to these bands we listen to. Because that's one thing I've never done is join a band that I, you know, that sounds like I want it to. I always get out of my comfort zone again, like with painting and stuff. Um, have you, I'm going to go off on a tangent real quick. Have you ever thought about doing a band that had music that you you listen to and you like because... i have i have the band name and i have i swear to god <laughs> you have everything you have i swear to merch. god dude it's on my desk in my house it's uh i have 10 songs written with the name the title and and kind of what the motif is for each song really and i have the 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 uh the painting the painting's not finished but it's already conceptualized in my mind. I'm already like, this is what we're gonna be called. This is what's gonna happen. Uh, so it's, I'm just gonna wait on that. I, <laughs> I don't wanna post any painting I'm doing for it. I'm gonna wait on the name that's and everything. Smart. It's until kinda it, smart, yeah. yeah. Until it literally manifests physically like, that's gonna happen first. That has to happen first. Um, I'm excited, dude. Yeah, that so it's kind of amazing. finding the friends that have the time to do something weird and time to kill. Because I've, I mean, like, like you and I have messed around with that sound, the the one yeah, that I know oh, you're yeah. talking it's, about. Yeah, yeah. And it's fascinating, man, because because your true influences come from projects involving Maynard James Keenan. 
Yeah. Oh, everybody knows that. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> so, oh, Danny so, Carey, the drummer, is my all time. Danny Carey, yeah. yeah. Primus. So, Primus. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, Tool, of course, in a perfect circle. Mm -hmm. Pussifer. Rage Against the Machine, like all that 90s era stuff. Right. But when you, but when you say Rage Against the Machine and, and Tool, there's, I mean, they're both from that era, but they're just. Different. But, but that's what I love. But you is like imagine, mixing, yeah, yeah, like imagine. Sound. Have you heard those mashups where they're mixing like yeah, Taylor yeah. Swift with Rage Against the Machine? Dude, either, <laughs> yeah, that's it's mine. It's like it kind of ruins the song forever because you right. only remember that. Like, uh, what was it? Uh, <laughs> uh, what's the name of that song that they put with uh, uh, "Killing in the Name of"? It was Rage Against the Machine killing it was in the Taylor name Swift of song. With, with with Taylor Swift yeah, singing yeah. Uh, "Never Gonna Be Together" or something. Like that. Dude, talk about ruining your that brain was... forever. It's, that's frying your brain on drugs. Yeah, man. Well, that's cool. Um, we're uh, we're running up on probably like uh, 10, 20 minutes left. Okay. So yeah. let's talk about um, drugs because medicines. You me mean? Yes, <laughs> medicines. There's medicines and then there's bad drugs. That's my opinion. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so you have had throughout this journey that you had in art and music and now film, you've kind of struggled with something that you mentioned course, you, yeah. you're, you told me already you're willing to talk about this of course oh and, yeah man and uh, that was your your depression you anxiety started... disorder slash depression like of course you hear that so much and this is like from from four or five years old my first memories being very very dark like there's you can see a lot in my art that's not necessarily like a commission or for a band it's very very ugly i guess you could say Dealing with that, um, of course, uh, it's it was tough, man. It's it's it. Some days it still is too. But um, using art as as you know uh, an escape, a therapy, um, saved me in so many ways. Music as well. But gr like growing up in a in a family that didn't know about a psychiatrist, they didn't know about antidepressants, they didn't know about you know stuff like that at all. Uh, it was kind of harder because I had nowhere to kind of find comfort in except for my art or my music. And it wasn't until I got older that I, you know, kind of experimented with the whole antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. And of course, what, what would give you anxiety? anxiety? What would freak you out? What were your triggers? Thoughts, man, it's weird. It's like my, it's kind of like, <clears throat> I explained this to my brother once that my imagination is my friend. And at times it, it turns like a, like a a demon you know like something for example like, oh like the vividness of my imagination like it uh like you're imagining like a as a kid those monsters under your bed are actually real the the same goes with the thought that scares the shit out of you and your brain doesn't know how to let it go so you become like kind of like obsessing about scary yes, thoughts or weird thoughts extremely i remember i would talk about like quantum physics because i was like into that and that yeah. scared you yeah like my mind couldn't uh, it kind of like kept me in a bubble for off and on for a few years where I was afraid to expand because things scared me like like the way the dark scares a kid was something creative in my head turning on me like it was a yeah. cool character idea but then that character literally was alive it's almost like you know you're losing your mind because the fear is guiding you to believe it's real so think of you know, someone who has a phobia with, with balloons or something weird like that. Like, to me, it's weird, but in my head, or in their head, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's real. Like, it's that scary balloon is them. the scariest thing in existence. Right. For me, it was my imagination that would turn on me. So I would, I literally, for years off and on, would get afraid of painting. I would get afraid of touching music because so I. So, how did you go from having those, like, intense, some might say, like, psychedelic fears? To becoming a freaking psychonaut, an, oh, an oh, ayahuasca yeah. psychonaut. Oh, yeah, so let, yeah. so, so let's yes. fill in that gap real I've quick. So after ayahuasca. your depression, uh, yes. what tr after your depression, what uh, what, early, what, what changed your mind? Because you were like yes. you mentioned a little straight edge, and then you started experimenting and developing this idea between medicinal plants. And yeah, versus but, bad drugs. Before I, the, the internet was huge, and you would find everything on Google. There were friends I had that were like, "Hey, man, I used to go through that, and I took, you know, shrooms one time, or I had an acid experience." And to me, it's like I couldn't justify that. I could no, that's not true. It, it's not like a real thing. So, um, 
I was just so afraid of it. Uh, after time, you know, of going through what I went through, I would just let time heal it, I guess, you know. So I would be depressed extremely for a period of like four and a half years straight, you know, with no break. And once I started researching and, and talking to those people more that had experimented with all these psychedelic drugs, like I said, there's good drugs and there's bad drugs, drugs they consider medicine. I finally looked into it and said, if I'm going to have any shred of hope, you're kind of going to have to jump off the deep end, which was psychedelics. I was doing all the, I was doing all this research and reading articles about it and how they were helping people with PTSD, with depression, anxiety disorders. So last year I went to this place called Soul Quest in Florida, Orlando, Florida, and it's a church of ayahuasca, like the strongest psychedelic. I what think. What do you mean a church of ayahuasca? It's, it's a church of ayahuasca. Uh, they, it's, it's, you know, to get through the federal bullshit to, to legally be able to do it, you have to, you know, they had to constitute themselves as a church and say, this is our reason for our religion. This is kind of like our holy water with Catholicism kind and of thing. So, and so, and so they admit you in as a member of the church Not before? No, no like... that's where the difference It's kind of like you, you go there, you have the experience. And you leave it's not like you know hey you need to come back for our sunday service it's nothing like that whatsoever it's just kind of like you know that's what they call themselves it's what it is it's how they got through the loophole of being able to do ayahuasca in america legally so you know the feds aren't on them anymore they had to write some hundred and something page letter you know to making it being able to be used on that property so I went there and I must say like it was it was the craziest the craziest experience because the type of people I met the how nice they were how loving everything is like uh and of course the experience is just mind blowing like you can't unless somebody else has done it you can explain it but you're not going to get it like you're not try gonna, <laughs> oh, shit man so so you so well, any you, any psychedelic in a high dose i guess you can you can say oh yeah dude it's like that like the the room started moving uh my hair and my arms and my legs started growing and like retracting like and my tattoos literally well, we're were gonna moving, go like, out with this so so talk about you so so we have established that you're going to this church that it's legal in florida to do ayahuasca yeah, yeah. by this loophole <laughs> and bless them. and so you show up you sign up you you know pack your skivvies in a box or something yeah, stay there for three days and and so so uh they probably prep you somehow right yes this is a cool thing compared to going overseas and doing it in like a jungle is that they have all the precautions you know of you know here you have an emt guy taking your blood pressure they're making sure you're not taking antidepressants antipsychotics anti-anxiety meds uh, because that can clash with you in your brain uh, and cause a whole lot of damage. They make sure, you know, your history on epilepsy or seizures, stuff like that. Like, they take so many precautions. And uh, that was very comforting, knowing you go there. And it's not like, oh, just shut up and take this. You know, they have a ceremony about it. Talk about the history of it. They talk about, you know, what kind of to expect if it's your first time, you know. And the people there are so experienced with it. You know, if you're scared or asking questions, they're there for you. And they, they treat you like family, which is really, really cool. Um, I've been there once since I took it to volunteer. I took a friend um, who was dealing with trauma. It was very, very bad trauma. Um, and, you know, they say it helps. Like, it opens up your heart. It opens up your mind. It's kind of scary because if there's something deep-rooted inside you you don't want to face... You're going to face it. If you close your eyes, it's going to be there. If you run, does, it, does that start like right away, or like what's the first it's like thing any that psychedelic, happens? Psychedelic, pretty much. Like you, you, you drink it, and it, the taste for me, I liked, but everybody around me that night, what it, it tastes was, like, it tastes like shit. Like, <laughs> but you well, liked it. I like shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. It, I see honestly, how that, I honestly, see how it tastes is. like raisins and dirt, like the the texture of dirt. How so it's, it's grainy. Of yeah, it's yeah. very thick. Like they make it very thick. I heard like impotent compared to other ayahuasca places. Like it's watery there. Here it was like, like um, 
like a very thick cereal you don't have enough milk in that you let sit there for a long time and it tasted to me like raisins and dirt and everyone was like this tastes like shit and i was kind of like getting the extra drop or two in my mouth because wow. it tasted good to me so but, uh, so so what happens after that how long before you, uh... you go to, yeah you go to your bed and it's like you can have a private bed private room your own entire room or um you're in i was in a room with like 20 people with floor mattresses and uh, it was really crazy, you know, you're sitting there with all these strangers and it's like clockwork, like the 45 minute mark, shit started kicking and I started hearing people cry, laugh, throw up, uh, piss themselves. And me, I was one of the last ones It was hitting, you're kind of, you know, I was like looking around like, fuck, am I that one guy? It's not going to take effect, you know, and then you get this uneasiness in your stomach and you start tripping your ass off dude like first comes the visuals then comes what the did emotion. you see um i'm actually doing a painting uh of this uh-huh one of the one of the glimpses i guess you could say because you see a lot of stuff you see fractals you know anyone psychedelic will psychonaut would tell you like fractals shapes colors auditory senses become like four-dimensional is weird like i heard a lady crying and she was in front of me behind me beside me oh weird oh in as i'm hearing her when was, you say that i think about lsd like yes, i've heard people yes, mention that lsd exactly, is like yes. that i've never done lsd but that's what they say when you take like would you classify lsd as one of the bad drugs oh or? hell no man like for me like i'll clarify it now like the psychedelics like mdma magic mushrooms uh ayahuasca stuff like Salvia. that is, is, it's like the it's like a medicine even marijuana like you know under meditative but i think there's some people that wouldn't understand that um so medicines are meant to alleviate something what do you think psychedelics are meant to alleviate that i, I think it makes you not Maybe. that you're prescribing or acting no, 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 as a no, medical no, no. professional, you. but yeah. you're my lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> but but like in your lay opinion, what do you think that those? It, I think there's a message in every experience, whether someone says they're having a bad trip or a good trip. There's a message in that experience, and you kind of have to dig. You kind of have to integrate after the experience to, you know, say, all right, this is what it was making me face, or this is what I should change about myself. It's very. It opens you up, man, like the dark side of yourself, the sad side of yourself. And that's why it can be an unpleasant experience. But that, to me, necessarily isn't a bad trip. Because you will learn from it. Yes. Would you I, say yeah. that there's people out there that are incapable of learning from those kinds of experiences or that it'll just be lost on them? I would assume, like, this is just my assumption, like, if your ego is that strong, of course. You can take anything, man, and it's not going to fix you. It's not going to cure you. It's kind of like, hey, here's an assignment that I showed you. Take it home and do the homework or not. You come back and flunk it. I don't give a shit. It's kind of not there to, to, you know, force you to do it. It's just there to show you. Yeah. So pretty interesting stuff, man. Like, yeah, it sounds interesting. <laughs> I, and you know what? Like, I would really probably consider going to something like that one day just because Honestly, of the potential I would go for growth with you man as your friend yeah. i would want to because i can go volunteer now that i've done it there right i just email them and say i wish to oh, be a wow. volunteer for this week and i go with you and it i would love to just you i want somebody to experience it while i watch them experience it because it yeah. was so such well, a cool i place. mean you know you just hear so many good things about it from like uh joe rogan i mean you know bad yeah. things too oh, yeah. but but like I've all like personally, and I know you're the same way. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you you choose to go through the difficult experiences in order to come out the other side wiser, smarter. Yes. You oh know, yeah. More reason. But <laughs> I don't think everybody's like that. In no, fact, I think there's a big chunk of the population that that isn't into self discovery, self awareness, long form podcasts. You know, anything <laughs> that anything that's going to expand. Yeah. Uh, you know, know, I've already talked to friends after my experience that said, there's no way in hell you will ever get me to do that. And I'm like, but wait, listen to the, the, the end part. They're like, I don't give a shit. I don't right. want to go through that. I'm like, yeah. well, you know, it's not, it's like, it's not for everybody. Um, that's unfortunate. But, it is. It really is. Yeah. You know, I, I, it made me look at so much in a different way or, or face it and have to go through it rather than bottle it up and use say, this is where you go into like say bad drugs like you use alcohol to to numb it you use cocaine you use meth 
those to me, this is like I said, the, the hard difference, drugs. Yes, yeah. the bad drugs is like how I say it, man. The shit that numbs you out is exactly the opposite of what a psychedelic, in my opinion, has done. Yeah, it makes sense when you say it that way. It's like uh, uh, one is like uh, you're you're revealing information, and the other one you're hiding it. Yes, yeah, and I've never done meth or anything. I've done, of course, used alcohol. Yeah, but I mean, they're so, downers. You know, it doesn't yeah, take a yeah. doesn't take a pharmacologist to <laughs> you know know what's going on. Yeah, man. Yeah. So. so. All right, man. Well, we're coming up on uh, about an hour and five, or I'm sorry, uh, 50 minutes. Did so I yap any, that yeah. long, man? I'm sorry. No, no, it's all, it's all good, man. <laughs> it goes by quick. Um, do you have any uh, parting shout outs or? Uh, I think I told everybody. Um, we got your art. We got your music. Well, my buddies that had helped me along the way are all there. You know, like they're, you know, the film, Josh and Andy. And I just, yeah, man, I, I think I did. I just. Thank them for helping someone like me who just has the ambition, but they have the, you know, the drive to do all the background stuff. And I, I plan to, uh, I don't know, man, keep going. Right on. So. Well, I think this went well and uh, we're going to get out of here, man. Uh, but thanks for stopping by. Yes, sir. And uh, and we'll, we'll do this again. Yeah. Fun. Hell yeah. Bye bye. And cut. Dude, that, it gets, I could do this every week. It's fun, dude. Yeah, it's, it is fun here. Hold on, let me drop the audio out because we're still bullshitting. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Whoops. All right, guys. Thanks for stopping by, uh, listening to the inaugural Squawk Out the Podcast episode. Um, we'll continue to have streams intermittently. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll have the podcast uh, up and running with some regularity in a couple of weeks. So we'll see you guys later. Cheers. time it is Marvin Devine Pull